Hello and welcome to the Poor Hammer Podcast, episode 59. I'm your host, Brad. This is my co-host, Eric. How's it going? We have an exciting dated episode for you this week. Warhammer preview. Yay! Yeah, so for us, this happened last night, and now we're recording it in front of a live audience. And like, honestly, it kind of continued into this morning, so like, we're still doing it in the same day, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, true. It was like one o'clock and they were still going. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't up at that point. It started at 11. I was like, oh, I'm gonna try and do this. Sat on the couch, started watching, and then, uh, then it was morning and my alarm was going off. Turns out, I'm old and can't stay up past 11 anymore. All right, enough of that, though. Let's get into the main topic. It's 10th edition. All right, so they started off really light. Yeah, I was like, are we going to follow, like, the way that they decided to waste a bunch of time? <laughs> I think we should, because to be honest, 10th edition is going to be 80% of this episode, so let's talk about everything else to be done with it. They started off with a model no one cares about. Whoa, whoa. Lionel Johnson is back and nobody cares. No. Throw him into the trash can. No. Arcs of Omen is getting a new book for him that won't exist three seconds after it goes live. You are absolutely wrong about the lion, because that is going to be a perfect kit bash for my Keldor Drago. Okay. I no longer have to lose the sword every five seconds that turns him around a bit for me all right if you're turning him into like drago or something then sure it's gonna be an awesome model for drago i'm super excited for it <laughs> i mean i have no idea about like lore if people are excited about hey we've got a primark maybe if we keep doing the reading book thing i'll eventually get there but uh i'm excited for the model <laughs> I also do enjoy the hooded badass. So, I mean, there's probably some work that needs to be done on it, and I'm not particularly good at kit bashing, but got a lot of work on orcs to do still, so I figure I'm going to learn how to kit bash, and I see a lot of potential in the lion. So, excited for it. But, yeah, Arcs of Omen, the lion, sounds cool, but it's always going to be sold out. Like, it's going to be out of stock. Okay, so, like, as a lore guy here, nothing is going to happen in the book. Yeah, but, I mean, it's a Primark. They're back, Brad. Campaign books can't do anything. <laughs> All a campaign book can do is set up an actual book. If something interesting were to happen in it, it will be retreaded on in a full book. Okay, I mean, it sort of makes sense. Aren't they, like, gearing up to have, like, a big showdown with Angron or something like that? Uh, sure, because someone has to job to the lion in his first reveal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, in, like, the first campaign book that Gilliman was in, he, like, solos Magnus and Mortarion on his trip to Earth in, like, two little five-page pamphlets. I mean, that's cool. <laughs> It'd be nice if there was, like, not just a five-page pamphlet for that kind of stuff, but... It doesn't matter is the point. I mean, okay, does any of the lore matter, Brad? Yes. No. I No. I like no. the lore. No. The lore is generally good. It's just campaign books are not where the lore is. Campaign books are like idea blogs. I thought you were going to say like fan fiction for a bit, and I was like, whoa. No, no, no. Whoa. <laughs> no. <laughs> Shots fucking fired. And it's like, we all know how Arcs of Omen is going to end. Do we? I don't. Okay, anyone who has read this far and has an adult brain knows how it will end fair enough <laughs> in the last one the vashtor one the big reveal of vashtor the new menace to the imperium a minor god of chaos oh my god he's so hype do you want to know what happened in it uh he got bellicor's backstory and then i don't know probably just fucked off so he assaults the rock the fortress that the dark angels live on where lion is secretly asleep Oh, okay. And his assault fails because no one can take down the Dark Angels. They're too cool. And so your big new bad guy immediately is dickless. That sucks. <laughs> The book ends with him and Abaddon and Abaddon going, damn it, you failed. And he's like, no, it's all part of my master plan. We can still turn this around. We're baiting out our secret goal, which is apparently waking up the lion, I guess. Woo. Bring back Cadius Fall. Yeah, so the the second they're like, it's going to be Angron versus the lion. Angron ain't winning this, chief. They got to sell the new model. Angron's old news. You already bought him. <laughs> Uh, I'm just like, rock falls, everyone dies. All right, so enough of the story that apparently doesn't matter. 
<laughs> we can move into Horus Heresy. Sure, they're doing Horus Heresy things. It's some like campaign book thing, I guess. I don't know. I don't understand Horus Heresy very well. This is apparently something from the last edition that's being done again that people were a fan of. At least that's what the sales team tells us. So I'll believe them because I don't play that game. <laughs> yeah, I, it's kind of interesting. But I am actually kind of surprised that you're not more into it. I don't like Spacemen vs. Spacemen. Yeah, I was going to say it's more like narrative play, but it's just Spacemen. So that makes sense. <laughs> you have an entire galaxy full of interesting species and dark powers at play, and you're focusing on that time they had the Civil War in America, but this time it's in space. <laughs> like, it, it's just dudes firing guns at each other. Yeah, okay, fair enough. On to something that is kind of neat is Kill Team. I mean, it's Kill Team, so I'm sure that you're not super hyped, but... I sort of am. I like what they're doing with Kill Team. They're making it their way to do backdoor new infantry units for 40k with the excuse of they'll sell more than if we just made this unit that is cool but niche. Right. It gets you the funding to make something you wouldn't get approved for by management. I get what it's for. And their models are really cool, dude. This gets more like AOS where they can make riskier things where to me it will do nothing. To someone else, it's the greatest thing ever. Yeah. Which is much better than the standard 40k, we brought back the Terminators again. I see what you're saying where like Kill Team has more of the extremes of like you really, really like it or like you don't like it. Yeah. They brought back Kroot and updated the Kroot kit. Yeah. They update things that it's like, look, this has a 90% chance to not interest someone but 10 percent of people are going to go buy this right and they're going to be super excited to have this as an opportunity and i mean i gotta say i like this one the dwarf that's got fucking knuckles holy shit dude that's so badass <laughs> <laughs> this is my only problem with it. I love the Beastman half. Yeah. It's a neat, unique unit. The Beastman lore in 40k makes no goddamn sense, but I'm here for maybe this being an excuse to pump that up a bit so that Zangor make more sense in the lore. <laughs> Fucking Zangor. And, you know, maybe write more than five words about them. So that half I'm happy with. The only thing that rubs me the wrong way with this kill team is the Votan half. Really? Because I love the new character. Amazing. Yeah. I like the idea of the Votan have some more options in their kit, I guess. But my problem is Votan came out, well, what, three months ago? Six months ago, maybe? Tops? If you got into Votan and you're so excited you finally get your Space Dwarves, you just bought everything you need. Right. And they're like, hey, your basic troop kit, you bought the old, the shitty version yeah. We've got the new one that's going to cost more money and only comes in this kill team box. So now you're going to have to start pumping out to get more of your basic troop that has all the options in the box. I didn't think of it like that because like I'm just looking at them. Holy shit. These are cool models. Like I actually really do like them. Even the ones that I'm not super excited for. I feel like there's like bits of it that I'm like, that's some cool kit. That's a cool weapon. That's, you know. Yeah. But I get what you're saying where it's like, why is this? the one that they chose to do now and not like give it a year if it was a new kit for votan i'd be super hyped yeah yeah continue expanding the line yeah update kit for the other army new kit for votan update kit for an army that's five months old feels so scummy yeah all right then we moved on to the main event the biggest news of the night the only thing anyone came here for right cities of sigmar no we're getting new seraphon <laughs> You and your dinosaurs, man. If dinosaurs aren't your favorite thing, fuck off. <laughs> I don't even want to fucking talk to you. Just leave. So it does help that AOS models are just awesome. They get to be riskier. It's what I like with AOS's design is every army is this will not appeal to you or it's the greatest thing you've ever seen. Yes. 40k has a bunch of riskless vanilla everywhere. Yeah. AOS is like, bet you won't fall in love with this beauty. And then it shows you Croxagore war spawned and you're like, oh my god. Real talk though, the vanilla Croxagore, I wasn't a big fan of. 
because they don't have their crocodile faces. They've got like the like bestial dragony face. Yeah. I prefer the Total War crocodile guys. Yeah, that's why like the War Spawn is just better. Yeah, so I'm probably just going to keep my one page rules ones I printed for my basic Croxigore and then I'll buy the new kit and make the War Spawn or whatever they're called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because those ones have like the elongated, it's not just like generic beast mouth. Yeah, they look more crocodilian. It's hard because it's not really my thing, but then I look at it again, I'm like, yeah, the inner six-year-old's like that rule of cool, man. That's cool. It's a dinosaur riding a bigger dinosaur. Yeah, and that's just, it's cool. It's literally what got me into Warhammer at all. Yeah, I was like, that sold you on Total War. Yeah, like, because at first it was, we did that first beginning of lockdown thing where we were doing our off-topic episodes, and we were like, hey, here's video games you can play. And you brought up like, hey, Total War is great. And I was like, I played Rome Total War when we were 12. It was fun. (laughs) And you were like, yeah, they've got Warhammer Total War. And I was like, I don't know Warhammer, but okay. And then like two months later or like a month later was Mandalore's video for Total War 2. Yeah, right, right, right. And, and like 20 minutes in, he's like, and here's the Lizardman. It's lizards riding dinosaurs. And I was like, how did Eric keep this information from me? <laughs> this is the greatest IP to ever exist. Hey, man, you know, I just love Total War. So, like, to me, I sold it fucking fantastically. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's what got me into this entire shtick, and now we have a podcast about 40k. Partly because the Seraphon line was hideous, so was the Skaven line, so half our playgroup had instant loss of interest when we went to get into tabletop. Oh my god, the Skaven. Oh god. So now that if this range refresh had happened three years ago today... We would be playing AOS as the primary. We would have never even looked at 40k. The majority of our playgroup wouldn't know what a Primark even was. Yes, we would probably be playing AOS as the primary thing and then you'd still have two armies in 40k. Yeah, so then uh, the rest of AOS news was just the the Grand Alliance Death is getting a new battle tome for Ossiarch Bone Reapers finally, because from what I remember from my AOS knowledge, just from watching too much Halo, is uh, Ossiarch Bone Reapers need some rules update stuff because everyone stole their shtick in 3rd edition. We're getting the Soul of Light Grave Lords 3rd edition battle tome as well because they were like the last 2nd edition one. So they were like mostly 3rd editionified, but it was like some things are wrong, like they don't have their Path to Glory section right and some other little stuff. So I'm not expecting that to change too much. No. Bone Reapers, I know, is one that I think a lot of people are expecting to change a bunch in AOS. So hopefully the fans of that get something. Was the model, the wolf model with birds that sold like grave lords is that a new model yeah so there's one new model for each of them so aos does this thing that i call the consolation foot hero right where hey you're existing this edition we don't want to give you anything but if we give you nothing you'll whine like 40k players do when they realize it's been two decades since they've had a new model in gray knights yeah so they give you what is a consolation foot hero every edition to be fair some of them are really cool i actually really like this one the ivia volga yeah the designs are pretty good usually yeah i think that model is really cool it's just so interestingly unique on how they did it to me aos models are always top tier yes and then they finished up aos with the cities of sigmar stuff Yeah, they just showed one model just to show off like, hey, the thing we keep talking about is going to exist. We're working on it still. But we're trying to figure out how to sell things in AOS that are not monsters because that's like why everybody's here. (laughs) And then uh, they showed that they can still waste money on Underworlds, so that's good. The Zinch half of that, I'll be stealing the Zangor from to make a unique Zangor Shaman. And I'll probably steal that main character because, oh my god, it's beautiful. Is that not super creepy and like... Yeah, that is so Zinch. And the problem is like, I want it with rules for any game I play, not fucking Underworlds. And technically, I know they eventually get a bad AOS sheet that doesn't count. Yeah, there's some really cool stuff with Underworlds, like... I see it show up in these, you know, these video releases and stuff like that. And I forget that Underworlds is a thing. 
And I'm like, oh my God, that's so cool. Oh, fuck. Underworld. Wow. <laughs> when I was watching the video, it was hilarious because they were like showing AOS stuff and they're like, now let's go to our next game. And it doesn't come up with a title. Yeah. And it starts like trying to like show you interesting pictures. And I was like, this is going to be Underworlds because they didn't advertise the game name. Right. They're just trying to sneak it in so that people like don't realize that it's Underworlds. <laughs> It's the same thing that happened with Kill Team. Yeah. When they showed Kill Team, they're like, all right, now back to something 40K related. And it shows like Warhammer 40,000. And then it starts showing like sexy shots of Votan and stuff. You're like, oh my God, second half of the range announced already? Yeah. Nope. Kill Team. Because it's using that orange thing that Kill Team is doing right now. And you're like, fuck, this was just Kill Team and they didn't want to show you the Kill Team logo or you'd turn it off. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Yeah, they, they knew what they were doing on that one, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is wild how Underworlds is still a thing, but we can finally move on to... The outro? Yeah, we can leave for the night, I guess. All right. Yeah, that's it. Sounds good. So yeah, then they dropped the thing we all knew was coming and has been rumored for literally a year now and has had very accurate detailed rumors for like six months. 10th edition is coming and it basically confirmed all the rumors for everything that got shown off. So there was like during the lion preview or whatever, I think there was a quote of like, nobody knew this. It was surprising how tight lipped it was. And I was like, how did... I knew about it. I don't know anything about this kind of shit. I don't care about the lore. How did I know about this? What are you talking about? <laughs> I feel like they had some great tongue-in-cheek moments with that, and the fact that they were supposed to be revealing Dante right before that, and he was already <laughs> yeah. spoiled so they couldn't even reveal Dante. Right. They were just like, yeah. <laughs> I, I was like, man, they have to be doing that British humor right there. <laughs> So I, I did enjoy that. That was kind of fun. But yeah, I mean, a lot of things that were leaked or rumored or whatever you want to call it were shown to us, basically. Yeah. And the trailer was amazing. Holy shit, that was cool. I actually showed it to my wife because she plays Tyranid, so it actually mattered to her in some way. That was actually a really cool cinematic. And the Tyranid Termagant that got shown off got her seal of approval, so I'll have to buy her another 60 of those, and then 60 of the new Hormagant and everything else. Oh my god. Dude, that Termagant is awesome. Yeah, it's a nice upgrade. The picture, they showed it during the presentation of, like, you're looking at you're like, oh yeah, that's a good new Termagon sculpt. Then they showed it next to the original. Yeah. And you were like, oh God, I forgot how like low detail, super old the originals are. Yeah. Like you put them next to each other and you're like, oh, the old one's so cute looking and the new one's like, <laughs> Okay, yeah, you're you're frightening. <laughs> yeah. I really like the new aesthetic they're going for. The extra I don't know if I want to call it extra detail, but like it's more serious because there's more detail. It feels more alien. It doesn't feel like a toy so much. And it like really brings out the vibes. It does quite a bit. And I'm here for it. Like the Tyranids need an upgrade for a lot of their models. So there's definitely some of them that like they can't do worse, to be honest. And this is a great first showing. So things that we're supposed to be getting are like new Lictors, new Biovores, new Shrikes, all of which are in the trailer. New Screamer Killer Carnifex. That's the one I'm most excited about. We'll see what it looks like. I don't care what you have to say. You're wrong about all of your hate it's the coolest fucking thing ever and the zerg ultralisk will prove you wrong every time they showed what looks kind of like the original carnifex model from like 1994 or whatever and it's cool and it looks terrible it looks so cool it's the only bad looking thing in that video brad has no understanding of what's cool or not he only sort of kind of understands dinosaurs and everything else he's wrong about so then <laughs> We were supposed to get a new, like, beefier brain bug that was between the Zoanthrope and the Maliceptor, and that appeared in this. That was there, too. And then they showed off a couple other things in the video that were kind of neat. There was, like, the... I guess everyone's been calling them the Venom Crawler equivalent, which I get because it's got the same spidery look, but it's got, like, the funny octopus mouth. <laughs> Your explanation on that was point. They have a weird shot. The only shot I don't like in that whole trailer... <laughs> Gilliman's in the middle of a serious talk 
while everyone's dying and the Terminators come in and for some reason they do like a Marvel movie comedy like PG family movie shot of two Tyranid monsters that go like what and like stare at the camera and like shock of the new fucking model Uh, but anyway other than that one weird shot i do love those models though they've got the cool tentacle faces i am quite excited tyranids have always been cool and they've got a lot of models a lot of them need to be updated and i'm excited for that but also having these like new things dude that's gonna be pretty awesome and then obviously like there's some spaceman stuff i don't think we need to cover anything with that really nah terminators don't matter okay <laughs> Primaris, whatever, man. Oh man, that was my favorite thing. Okay, so real talk. There was a cute moment where they revealed the new Terminators. They revealed the video showed Primaris with flamers. That was pretty cool. Oh, there was the awful Boomer Bait box dread looking Redemptor. Yeah. Where they're like, what if we took the nice arms off a Redemptor and gave it the 1993 box special? (laughs) It looks just like a box dread. And you're like, could we not do that? That looks so bad. Yeah. You have arms. You could have this on a nice swivel joint so you get actual aim. You could put this on the end of an arm. You could have it be shoulder mounted. There's a hundred things you could do. That would make more logical sense than the old box dread design. Nope, we're just going to put it back to the box dread design because boomers are mad about Primaris. (laughs) Absolutely wild. The other thing I loved, though, was after they showed off the new Primaris Terminators, they were like, since chat just asked, which I'm assuming was a fake thing that chat didn't ask, but they wanted to have it be someone not them advertising it. Yeah. These can be old Marines or Primaris. They could be anyone in the Terminator armor. It doesn't have to be a Primaris Terminator. Right. Please stop complaining about us Primarising the whole line. You can just have them upgraded into it to be cool. (laughs) So it's like, okay, we're finishing off the final two things, because we all know the jump pack things have been spoiled for forever by leaks. Yeah. As long as that exists and we got the Primaris Terminators, old Marines can finally go. Yeah, I mean, they did a good job of selling the stuff during the promo video. Like, they looked really cool in it. I want to be a shitbag, but I can't. When the librarian comes in in Terminator Army, you're like, fuck, that looks awesome. Oh, yeah. Any of the, like, the beacon teleport down to, fucking awesome. That's cool as shit. Though, I will say, when the Terminators come down, there's, like, that money shot of the Terminators, and they do, like, the slow-mo him firing the Gatling. I'm like, this is getting a little masturbatory we get this is the only thing in the old marine line that was ever good looking yeah and you really want to show it off again we get it there were definitely like key shots of like this has to be in there (laughs) this still needs to exist and then we'll build the rest of the frame around it the marketing guy's like no slower motion exactly slower i was honestly surprised that they didn't like go full for the flamer part put the vietnam war song the uh fortunate son fortunate son (laughs) welcome to astalia gentlemen (laughs) i was like i I was just like waiting for it to happen and then i was like no they probably won't make that joke though they should have (laughs) i'm sure there will be fan edits by the end of the week yeah it was very cool and as much as brad you bitch and complain about all of the old marines and stuff like that like terminators are here man i won't ever say terminators aren't the coolest thing i love them man they did a good job of hyping it up in that preview video i will say there's one last thing with the trailer part i love that it does the beautiful bait and switch where it starts off with the annoying propaganda thing but it's being said by gilliman right and as like a lore guy i'm like why is gilliman saying these lines this is stupid and then he like switches into like this is all bullshit all of this is propaganda we're losing our asses out here as like everything goes to shit and it starts showing the real things happening like oh god all these space marines are dead everything's going to shit the tyranids are invading everywhere this is such a good trailer from the like opening to the turn into the climax and then it just settles on like everything falling while he watches in his like absolute ultra depression 
the voiceover was amazing. It did exactly what it needed to do because as they were doing like the propaganda, it was in a way of like, that's not really like real propaganda. Like you're saying the lines, but you very clearly are going to switch into like, nah, that's bullshit. I'm torn because I really wish they had just used John Banks who does like Gilliman's voice in all of the 40k books because that's Gilliman's voice to me. Okay, yeah. So when it's showing Gilliman and I'm not hearing the voice I've heard for like, 40 plus hours it's really weird and i know that's gonna be another thing like if they do the like 40k amazon or hbo or whoever the fuck bought it if they do that show it's gonna be really weird if there's someone who's like a major audiobook character i know and it's suddenly a different voice that's not the one that i've heard just be like me don't have to listen to any of it and it's all new I feel like we should probably kind of start wrapping up like the gushing about the previews and start actually talking about like meat and potatoes. The big thing. Let's get into 40k 10th edition. They talked all about how it's going to work. There was a lot more said in the article afterwards that wasn't just the sales pitch and had to say more truthful things. I am mostly positive on this. I have hesitations in a couple points, but overall, it is a lot of good changes, even if a couple of them, I feel like they want the credit for something they're not doing. Yes. So I think there's very cool ideas that have been very obviously in motion for a while now, and that they're finally going ahead and doing it. And one of my major concerns on the transition from what we've got in 9th, 8th, and stuff like that into the new, like, more streamlined well that transition period is going to be brutal as hell because it's going to take three years for them to finally finish it all but they did kind of answer how that's going to happen so we're getting indexes to start with yes which is the first big point there's a couple layers of the things here we are getting indexes to start with the rules of the game they are supposed to be simplified and streamlined but that does not mean they will be simplistic and boring which when you sell it to me with that wording it tells me that you already fear i'm going to notice that yes they're bragging about one page rules because they know that everyone likes the one page rules thing going on who doesn't like 40k and they want all those people playing 40k right and the rules have bloated this is where we get into a game design thing there is a difference between i am going to streamline my game because it will make my game better right and i am going to streamline my game into this specific corner case because it's a meme i'm going to make the whole rules to my game one page is that correct should it be like three and a half pages should it be maybe the core rules are 44 four pages and then you only need about three pages or four pages per army depending on the army and they're like no we want to sell it as a fact one page one page rules is popular i want them out of my scene i get what you're saying it's tough because like i didn't get that full impression of like oh we're just doing this to compete kind of thing it came off in the rules guy who was hosting sales pitch yeah of like Hey, I know people are going to think that this is like, oh, we're doing this because we want to compete and we want to show off and hey, tagline. But like, hey, no, really, we we thought about it and it's going to be awesome. But hey, we thought about it it was going to be awesome is kind of concerning. It's spooky. So there's the one page rule part. So the big thing was free rules, but we'll get back to that asterisk. Yeah. Well, because it's, it's free rules because everybody's getting the free indexes at the start. So everybody's kind of playing 10 instead of not. <laughs> we'll get back to it. There is general powering down. So less AP, less all that. Yeah. Less stratagem bloat. Thank God. General addition changes like, you know, they're going to change up rules for things like how terrain functions or little things like that throughout. That one honestly scares me. It doesn't scare me much because it's every edition they tend to go, what are the minor issues with how terrain currently is? One of them right now is GW really fucked up on we sell terrain that doesn't work in our terrain rules. So now we have to put all our terrain on glass so that it fucking functions with our ninth edition rule set because that's not how we sell terrain. Right. So this is where I'm fine with them going, hey, maybe we should do ninth edition terrain rules, but we fix it so it works. I hope that they don't try and go like too far of like like you can streamline terrain rules and then get into a problem with competitive nature of like 
because it's been streamlined, you haven't thought of this case, this case, and that case. And I'm going to angle shoot the fuck out of it. So another thing is with the whole one page rules, you only need one page to play bullshit they're trying to advertise. That's A, slightly inaccurate, which we'll get into. And B, that comes with the whole when you get a sub faction, you change out what your rules look like. Right. That gives me some hope. Unfortunately, they only use Space Marines as an example, and Space Marines are always treated as special children, and I'm afraid it's going to fall apart the second they reach a codex that is not Space Marines. I think it'll be okay, but I'm optimistic. We're coming back to all these. Yeah. And then uh, they are AOSifying a lot of stuff, which is not a negative thing. AOS has a lot of good rules stuff going on in it. For those who want like a quick rundown, AOS is rules versus 40Ks. They are both free on the community website. Ninth edition's rules are 26 pages. AOS's are 44. That is not because AOS is more complicated. It's because the rules are better written. So if you have a question, you can go read it and it is properly worded. It catches the corner cases. The rules are much better. It has a lot less raw versus... Yes, you're not fighting over what the intent of a rule was. Yeah. It is very well spelled out when you have to go get it. And there's very abbreviated versions of each rules for the general play. And that is what I think saves this whole one page thing, but we'll get into it. And then there is changing morale to be Battleshock, but not AOS's Battleshock because AOS and 40k both have morale issues right now. It's a new form of AOS Battleshock that'll be something else we are losing detachments and it's becoming more like aos with how they do battle line stuff which is not negative it's just different it may be negative in certain aspects but we'll get into that i mean i i think it's gonna be nice i generally like it and we're kind of already going towards that with aol yeah, yeah. And one thing I do really like is data sheets. Yes. Are getting AOSified and AOS has far better their battle scrolls beat the hell out of 40k data sheets. Much better design. <laughs> Yeah, it's so, so much better design. It's not even close. Okay, so that covers all like the major things I can think of that they announced. Let's go back through and do them in detail though. Okay, so which one do you want to start with? Let's start with the big elephant in the room. The actual rule structure and the freeness and the how that's actually going to turn out. So the freeness... Let's go there because that is the... They really wanted you to give them props. In their sales pitch, they were very clever on their wording. They talk about how when 10th edition starts, the rules are free, just like y'all been asking for. You'll be able to download the core rules off of our website. You could do that last edition. You can do it with 9th edition right now. The core rules are free on the website. Yes. The problem is you need far more than the core rules to play the game. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah at least in 9th edition, like you need the army rules and all that stuff but i mean they were like oh but we're gonna give the indexes out for free as well and that's how everybody's gonna be playing 10th edition yes so you're going to start off with free rules but they are selling the indexes as well if you want a physical version or if you want like physical data cards of your index sheet love it i love the idea of here's free rules but if you want you know special art on it you want the data cards you can buy it. Fantastic. Love the idea. My problem is when you go read the follow-up question that you have mentally, okay, but are my rules going to stay free at all edition or am I going to have to buy them later? And like our codex is just gone? Are we just going to stay in index land? Do all the rules, are they all balanced up front so we all get to play the same game together and it's not whoever gets a codex next is broken until the next one till the next one? Right. Yeah, so that's all going to be the same as always. <laughs> in the article, it flat out says... Codexes will return to replace these free rules, but when they do, the complexity of the game won't increase, thanks to the one-in, one-out ethos of army and sub-faction rules. Effectively, you will only ever need your data sheets, the two pages of rules that govern your chosen army, plus the core rules and whatever mission you are playing. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, that just says the quiet part out loud. Codexes will be replacing those free rules you get, and you're going to go back to paying for them. Great. I mean, to be fair, it doesn't explicitly state that you have to buy the codexes. It's heavily, heavily implied. That sentence is written in a way where they know they can't write it any other way or it will be actual false advertising and they'll get sued. Yes, exactly. Codexes are going to cost money. You're going to have to pay $40 for a codex to get a little QR code in it that someone can steal when you accidentally take a picture of it. And that'll be how you get it digitally in your app so you can get it digitally because they won't just let you download a two-page PDF file. Yeah... 
it's going to go right back to where you're at. You don't actually get free rules. Ignore that ad campaign. Yeah, basically. I mean, that's essentially what it boils down to. Fine, whatever. I hope the index thing with the they can you can buy the cards. I hope that goes fantastic and they realize that like that's just how it should be. No, it won't. But I can have the hope. It'll be torpedoed from the start because it's indexes. Yeah. Because you know this is temporary for the next few months, you won't buy it. Right. This is right down to this edition starts in less than 12 weeks if it's like every other year. It'll be mid-June. Yeah. Or mid-July if it gets delayed. Yeah. I mean, we're like 12 to 20 weeks max, basically. If you bought a World Eater Codex <laughs> or an Astra Militarum $200 box with a Codex in it. Speed run. Go fuck yourself. Yeah. You lost that money, you chump. You trusted GW. You still get the cool art, Brad. So this is why <laughs> buying your rules is a really dumb idea. Yeah. So that part still annoys me. Overall, I like the idea of indexes, although we did hear in like interviews from previous employees and stuff that they've always had issues with power downs because <laughs> they look at a codex as it needs to sell. Yep. It is not a balanced thing. It is a thing you are selling this quarter. People don't buy codexes when they're casual. They won't buy a codex if the codex downgrades their army, which is why indexes are the beginning of the edition thing that are like torpedoing their own sales because the index is going to nerf you to oblivion. It's a power reset because we've had too much power creep. Yeah. We already saw the new Termagant. It's worse than the current Termagant. That is fine because the game had to get reset so that they can power creep again to start sales. Yeah, and I mean, there's a decent amount that's changing to how the play is going to happen, so... All live games do this. Yeah. Magic the Gathering, well... Hold on. Magic the Gathering used to do this. Now they've entered the Yu-Gi-Oh phase of their lives where they're just trying to get as much money as possible through power creep. But it used to be you get a couple powerful sets in a row, and then they would dumpster the power level of the next set or two to reset your expectations, and then sprinkle the power level back up, and then dumpster, and then sprinkle it back up. And that's how you keep people interested. It it does help mostly harmlessly as long as the game is balanced, but it does have the feel bad moment when you enter from a god mode back to being the washed up dude on the beach. Wow. Call out to (laughs) Path Exile. Well done. (laughs) League restarts are harsh. Yeah, they are. They're fun though. So... Yeah, you're right. The indexes are not going to be a massive success. And so they're going to probably get a takeaway of that of like, oh, the codexes are the way everybody wants it. Let's make it so that they continue to buy it. So, uh, you know, whatever. If that's what happens, that's what happens. It's not any worse than it is right now. Yeah, my problem is not the reset. My problem is not the index. My problem is don't advertise to me that all the rules are free when I know damn well you're going to try to sell me rules in eight months when the first codex comes out yeah quit trying to convince me so that covers that part the actual two-page rule thing i kind of did my rant on it is a thing where in the press thing the the sales pitch they advertised it i think the guy was like really trying to play up comparison to one page rules because he did mention one page and they corrected to a spread which means a two page open up two pages in a book is a spread i don't think it's going to be one single page actual literal one page no in the article itself it is a two page spread for your rules that you'll need during gameplay plus all your data sheets and that's for each sub faction once the codex thing is coming out. So it's not like, oh, your entire army that was a full codex is now on a single page. That's just not how it is. <laughs> yeah. And when I went through the test stuff today, I was able to condense some of the simpler codices currently. Yeah. In text form down to only a few pages. If you like remove all of the useless, the crux maledictum is a super heavy gun that right. fires dead animal bones blessed by the dark god. When you got all that crap out and it's just it's plus one strength, plus one damage. Well, and you also got out the oh, this is a stratagem for a single model. Oh, this is, you know, stuck related to this other model. Like you just put it in the data sheet. That doesn't need to be part of the rules anymore. And you can get like the uh each of the demon sub codices, because it's four codexes. 
Each of those can go down to a, like a literal one page rules. Yeah. They don't even take two pages. This new style actually kind of fixes a lot of problems with how demons was smashed together. They don't have yes. to smash it together like that anymore. My test run with demons kind of showed that like demons was too far for their fucking own ad campaign where they were like, when you transform from a whatever Marine to an ultramarine first company, you change out your two pages to a different two page pages of rules i'm like you can't even fucking do that with the demon codex when i compile it down to like shorthand it's, it's like they don't have two pages between these four fucking armies that are all stuck together in the same book yeah so you could like double our rule count and it'd be nice there now when you got to the bigger armies you're losing a lot and it's not even just the bigger armies it's also the armies that have more play in all of the phases there's that part and there's the there is a difference between how necrons and my thousand sons are going to handle this my necrons don't have two pages worth of rules if we're being honest we have six bad warlord traits we have five bad relics and one okay one we have one extra warlord trait and one extra relic for each of our sub factions. We've got two paragraphs worth of rules. Our sub factions switch out some of those rules. We've got an every turn rule that eats up probably another two paragraphs. And then we've got our data sheets. Yeah. Necrons will actually be able to increase in complexity while staying to this two page thing. All they lose is their 40 terrible stratagems down to six terrible stratagems. And on that, I do want to say like there's obvious stratagem bloat in a lot of the codexes. But at the same time, we talked about in last episode. We talked about it in my demon codex review. We can't have just three that doesn't work they went down to six to eight for each demon sub faction the problem is slanesh has like what six of them or seven of them i forget which yeah slanesh has that many one of them is dedicated to if you're playing against fucking eldar right you can do a reroll thing. Like that is when you're stuck down to six stratagems, you don't have room for vengeance for Prospero. <laughs> don't add that. Keep that in Crusade. Yes. It's stupid. That should not be one of your stratagems. If you're cutting the bloat out, that's the bloat. Don't leave the bloat and cut out the good shit. There is a lot of potential to pushing those types of things into something like Crusade, where it's like, yeah, the rules to your army are two pages or whatever. And then you've got your data sheets and all that. But that's because that's like the core. If you want like the flavorful stuff, that's just like whatever, then there's these missions and, you know, whatever is going on with that. So back to my point, Necrons can increase in complexity while going up to two pages worth of rules for your sub faction. If you trade them out for two whole new pages of rules for the next one. Yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> Here's where it becomes a problem. They only talked about Space Marines and Space Marines are special snowflakes because they will screech at the top of their lungs until you give them a fucking lollipop. If you try to treat their sub factions like sub factions. They want every one of their sub-factions to have more rules text for it than anyone else's whole army with all of its sub-factions put together. And I want sub-factions for my sub-factions because this sub-faction is actually super important and like... <sighs> They, they talked about that in the video too. His listed sub-faction was Ultramarine's first company. Why? Which is, it's not even the whole Ultramarines. Which, okay, fine. I guess that makes sense on, you know, it gives you more options, which is cool. And to be honest, if you're trying to sell me a codex, you better have enough rules in there with all of these hundreds of sub factions to make me want to spend $65 on your two pages of rules. Yeah. At least if I can argue to myself, well, it's actually a hundred pages of rules. It's two pages and you get to pick which one to play. Yeah. Okay. Then it's more like actually you're paying for a bunch of possible builds, I guess. Yes. Sure. But you're not getting 65 fucking US dollars out of me so that you can hand me a two page piece. PDF. <laughs> 65. Uh, yeah, okay, 75 because they'll inflate it twice more. So anyway, the problem child is not Necrons or nope. the demons. The problem child is when you have a codex like Harlequins, Grey Knights, Thousand Sons, World Eaters, but they already failed, so I'm very afraid. Yeah, it was like World Eaters should have. So the problem is when you have an army where we've got eight data sheets of any importance, let's put it this way, you have eight models that you can build. Yeah. With different loadouts and whatever, but like... Sure, sure, sure. You can say he's a super D special sorcerer, but it's still one goddamn tin can. <laughs> You're not wrong. 
when your army lives in the front of the book, when you're trying to make your five data sheets feel like a full game, those armies are going to die. Yeah. Like, 10th edition is going to be fucking miserable. It's going to be worse for the two of us because Thousand Suns and Grey Knights, they bragged about it like it was a good thing when they're like, there's no more psychic phase. Your psychic power is on your data sheet and it's going to be some basic fucking psychic gun. It was like, Smite, it's going to be like a gun. I was like, holy shit, why am I even playing Grey Knights? I'm glad I have orcs still. That's going to be awesome. Better get building those. Yeah, so like, they used Magnus as an example and they were bragging about it, how they're like, Magnus, you know, that that guy who is known for creating the planet of the sorcerers, who is the greatest living psyker alive. We're going to show how powerful his psychic abilities are. He's going to have a bigger psychic gun than everybody else. And I was like, fucking shoot me in the face. How cool. I'm so glad that psychic is just turned into a gun. We've devolved into, it's a fucking las cannon. And I mean, there's going to be more than just guns. It's going to have like command phase type things and whatever. They mentioned the normal psychic powers are turning into AOS powers. Okay. That is fine on a normal army. Yeah, it is. Where like you get like a few psychers. Fine. It's a problem when you and I are loading out an army and it's like, I have three data sheets. Yeah. If the psychic power is not a choice, it's on the data sheet, and I want to bring more than three models. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck am I supposed to do? Yep. In AOS, it's you don't bring that many wizards, you jackass. <laughs> like, you only get six spells, you take, like, two good wizards. Right. And fine, if that's what the new normal is, fine. But I am not happy about it because Grey Knights and Thousand Sons are psychers. And Zinch Demons were supposed to be, but we already we already lost. The whole army are wizards, okay? If I only get three wizards, then what am I doing? I am definitely negative on specifically one of my armies. Yeah. For the majority, like my Drakari, my Necrons, everything sounds fine, depending on how this sub-faction thing works out, if it's got enough complexity to still be a real game. I think orcs are going to be amazing. I'm honestly excited for orcs. Any army with a shitload of data sheets yeah. wins from this. And AOO is already showing like the whole, the style of building lists can have a lot of fun to it. And the changes that are going to be made in 10th are helping that out as well. And like orcs are going to be fun. Yeah, and like, I think my Drakari will be fun. I think my Necrons will be fun. I'm just, I already have no hope for Zinch Demons to ever be done right. <laughs> yeah. And I really have no hope for Thousand Suns based off what we've been told. The reason I like it is I like Hero Hammer. It's fun. I like getting to choose. I am going to play the army with a 20 minute psychic phase. That is my army's shtick. If that army is forced to just be Chaos Marine sub-faction that gets an extra spell, oh boy. And, I mean, it's even worse, honestly, for Thousand Sons because a lot of yours is during list building, choices of what you're taking. Like, Grey Knights are less to that. Like, we get shoehorned a little bit more. So If, if my non-character units were stuck like the Grey Knight ones, that's fine. That's an addition change. Right. Fair enough. The problem is my characters are the entire point of that faction. The rest of the army is there to protect the characters. Oh, yeah. Honestly, that's kind of how I enjoy playing Grey Knights as well, where it's like, I want the librarian. Out of all of this, though, I hope I'm wrong. I hope they figure out how to make Psychic still feel like Psychic and Grey Knights and Thousand Suns still be fun Psychic-based armies. I really, really hope that it works out. I don't have high hopes, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see. I already have a shelf-sitting army. So if it just trades which one it is, it won't be the end of the world. I feel like this is the one misstep that I heard. Yeah. Now, the sub-faction thing itself could be very interesting. I need to see proof that they're sticking to it. If you give me six sub-factions in a book and they all have wildly different rules and, like, I really feel my choice, right? I'm in. I'm there. Yeah. If I can do a whole episode about Novak Dynasty and then turn around and do one on Nihilic and you don't feel like it's a rerun, that's the best possible outcome. Right. Now, the question is, will it happen? I mean, we've seen that they can make sub-factions unique and interesting. They've done it. We've also seen half of the codices. We've seen Death Guard. We've seen World Eaters just not having them. We've seen Demons just not having them. We've seen Guard be switch your two abilities. There are some stinkers out there. Yes. So we'll see what happens kind of thing but i'm still optimistic that it will work out 
And, you know, maybe not every single sub-faction is a fucking home run. If there's a good handful of them that are solid options, okay, cool. It's good enough, man. It's just not going to be worse than ninth. Just don't make it worse. <laughs> I also fear one other thing, which is when you remove all of the power from the front of the book and onto the data sheets. Yeah. Data sheet heavy armies gain the most. Yes. When the power is moved to the data sheets, the more data sheets you have, the more the favorite child you are, the more it self feeds into you are now more powerful. Assuming they didn't fuck up and write 150 bad data sheets all at once. Yeah, but I mean, realistically, it's just basic statistics at that point of like, if you have 150 data sheets, most likely they're gonna miss on five of them. Whereas if you're Harlequins, if the troops suck... <laughs> you're just fucked you have no like fallback kind of thing so yeah it, i see what you're saying so again these are problems where if a good game designer made these rules this will all end great oh yeah it honestly can be awesome it comes down to does gw have good game designers 10th edition is going to put it to the test it is it really is. It's going to be glaringly obvious when they fail. And I really hope they don't. I hope beyond hope that they prove me a fool. But, I mean, there's no real way until it comes out to see. Just have to, just have to hope. So there is more stuff going on with 10th edition, and a lot of it is great. And, like, I want to give props overall. There is the chance for problems where we mention them. Most of these changes are great. I want to put out the thing that I think is the coolest, which is the new data sheets. Mm -hmm. I have it up on my screen right now because I want to talk about it. That design is awesome. Well done. It gives all the information you need. It does it in succinct manners. And they did kind of also show off the like dual purpose data sheet kind of thing. That already had me questioning it was interesting. I like it. This reminds me of Indominus. Oh, okay. When that box came out, we had different data sheets compared to the Codex data sheets. Right. They showed two versions of the Termagant data sheet. One of them had the rippers on it. I assume because there are rippers on the sprue in the new Gaunts, and they had to put the rules into the Indom box, whatever it'll be called this time. It's the Lions edition, so it's got to be something about betrayal. Yeah, Sussy Baka sounds right. I'm sure that's exactly what it is. But it's very likely because that only showed Flesh Borer, and that showed the Rippers on the data sheet with the Gaunts. And then we saw like the true Termagant full data sheet later where it had its actual options. The abilities didn't line up. They had different abilities. It's not that there was the extra ability. It's that the first ability is unique on those two data sheets. Right. So this is going to be one of those weird things where if you get the index data sheet or the promo box data sheet or your codex data sheet that comes out four months later because it usually comes out in like October because they fuck it up, you may end up with three Termagant data sheets in the first three months. I hate that that's very likely. Don't worry. I'm sure you can open your new GW app and it'll all be okay. It'll be right on there, I'm sure. Definitely. <laughs> okay, but enough trashing. Let's get back to the actual data sheet itself. Let's focus on the final data sheet that got shown off, not the hybrid one you were talking about. Right. The actual Termagants. It's a beautiful data sheet. The top of it shows you your unit. Which is... Thank you. It shows you your relevant stats, and it only has six stats now, which is actually down. And it's got a new stat in addition, which makes it even more impressive. Because your ballistic skill, your weapon skill, got moved down to be gun dependent, which makes more sense. It yes. gives you another knob to tune your options with. Yes. There's no reason that isn't how it always should have been. The gun is what dictates it to a certain point. So let's put it there. Brilliant. And another thing that it shows is the Devourer isn't like rapid fire or anything like that. It's just gun, which is something I've always said should have been the case with bolters. Yeah. Rapid fire is like a weird rule to have on your basic gun. Like, Right. The Space Marine is the, the vanilla unit of the game. It should have the least bullshit going on. Yeah. And they tend to be piled in bullshit. So when you get a newbie into the game and you hand them the faction that's targeting newbies who are idiots who will pay the subscription service to get the new model every six months. And they're like, but why does my, I just want to use the gun to shoot them. Yes. But it's got all those other words on it. That's where you should get rid of no, no fear. You should get rid of the 50 other sub rules that I don't remember that Space 
Space Marines just randomly have. Get rid of Shock Assault. Yeah, just bake it into the weapon. If it's important, put it into the base stats. Yeah. If it's not important, dump it because it's complexity on something targeting the new player and change the points accordingly so that you end up with the same balance standpoint. Yeah. And if you want to make it a complex thing, that's okay. Make it into a, like, this is obviously a complex unit. The guns have these restrictions and these options. And that is fine, but that probably shouldn't be the bolter. No, it shouldn't be the bolter. The Termagant Spine Fist is an assault pistol twin link. I don't even know what twin link means. Sounds cool. But there you go. That can be the thing that has the weird complicated stuff, not your basic weapon. Yeah, I'm here for this change. All of it is great. (laughs) And we don't have to worry about, oh, this unit has all of these options of guns and it has a ballistic skill of two up. Yes. Well, that is a problem for these two options. The rest of them, it doesn't matter. But these two options, it's a big problem. So we have to balance it around those two, which means that all the rest of them aren't actually options because they're bad. Or you end up with the opposite. So you've got your basic unit of guard, but one of them has a sniper rifle. Yeah. Why is the sniper rifle hitting on a coin flip? Why not just make it so the sniper rifle has a two up? Yeah, right. It just makes sense, honestly. It just makes sense. And it cleans a lot of things up. So the data sheet is wonderful. And getting rid of OBSEC and changing it to objective control. Cool. This is how AOS handles their version of OBSEC. Theirs is bracketed by like wound count. But here they just realized again, because 40k and AOS are constantly learning from each other. Yeah. So this is a further evolution of how controlling points worked in AOS, where, you know, a big model counts as three models. A bigger one counts as five models. Gargant's count is like 20 models. I don't even remember. And then your your little dude just counts as one model. It reminds me a lot of like knights. Give them the ability to count as more. Yeah, because when it was dubbed in 8th edition, when a knight and a guard stand on a point and the guard owns the point. That doesn't make any sense. And this new stat line allows a large range. It has more nuance and variability to it so that it can actually be interesting. And one thing you'll find on these data sheets that isn't there at all is it doesn't tell you this unit is a troop or battle line is the term that it's saying now because we're AOSifying this too. In AOS, your sub-faction can change the rules for what is and is not battle line. In AOS, that is helpful for filling out detachments and stuff, which is gone in 40k 10th edition. But in 10th edition, it's there so that you can run more copies than three of certain things depending on your sub-faction. Yes. So you could think of it like, this is hypothetical, but let's say you're playing Iron Hands and you're like, but I want to play six Dreadnoughts. Then Dreadnoughts might be battle line for Iron Hands. That would be cool. Maybe Flamer Guys are battle line if you're Salamanders. So you can run like five squads of Flamer Guys. And I think that plays up to the aspects that I really do enjoy out of AOO and like the way that we can, we have so much flexibility in list building. While also not just being like, hey, throw whatever you want. There's no rules. And to be honest, if you're not going to break something, I have found AOO is often just run three of whatever you want. Yeah. For the vast majority of stuff, you never are trying to get over three of any given slot. So it basically already felt like this just pick an HQ and then rule of three the rest of your army. Yeah. And I really do enjoy that. In a way, like, I don't think too much will change And this gets rid of one of the cheese things that was an issue partway through the edition with like, hey, what happens if someone brings, you know, 120 racks to a tournament? Right. And they go, why the fuck would someone do that? Well, that guy just did and he's winning. Yeah. (laughs) I like that they did some minor changes. So you, you go rule of three for everything. If it's battle line, you can go up to six copies of it. But those are only going to be for like flavorful things for a sub faction. Like, let's say you want to play really destroy your heavy. Yeah. Then maybe Novak gets to run six units of score packs. And honestly, it feels very free in list building to do what you want while also trying to limit the amount of just stupid nonsense. And the last thing on the data sheet that we can point out is the flesh borer lost its AP that it never should have had. That was the big what the fuck when we saw the Tyranid Codex. 
So, yeah, AP is... Uh, they mentioned their dumb string AP across the board, which is pretty good. I mean, it's good because in ninth it was such a problem that we needed an entire field kit medic bandage. <laughs> and in addition to that, toughness is having its range increased, which I'm kind of hoping affects more than just the top end. Because right now it's like space brains are all four. A custodian is five. An orc is five. It doesn't make any damn sense. We could increase the spread here. Let's make the Space Marine like a five, and then I can make a Custodian like a seven, and maybe an Orc is a six. And then we like we can get into like actual tanks that are armored. And they did mention toughness goes past eight, and the one guy's like, toughness can go past 11. <laughs> it's like, okay, so I guess you just said knights are 12, thanks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but they did mention with toughness increasing, strength is not. So things are going to become harder to kill, especially at the top end, because your melta is still going to be strength eight, meaning you may wound a knight on five still. Okay, so it is really one of those, like, things are just generally becoming tougher. Yeah, and it also helps because there's also those weird overkill weapons, like a knight has, like, <laughs> they swing at, like, strength 16 or whatever, or strength 15 all the time, and you're like, great, this does nothing other than be funny. Like, big number, cool, I get it. You're like, oh, this would now wound a knight on a three, even though knights have toughness 12. Yeah. Whereas before, it was just doing that anyway. I'm aware the 16 math doesn't work, but you get the point guys yeah quick mass with brett so honestly the the toughness changing has me pretty excited for nurgle because like right now nurgle is real real disappointing for what nurgle's supposed to be doing i have expectations of this toughness change helping there so that'll be cool i hope the toughness change just makes it so toughness matters yes because a lot of armies had weird balance issues where they acted like orcs going from toughness four to toughness five was a huge deal yeah and math wise it was not with how the game was being played it didn't matter it really didn't i think all of this put together the toughness the strength the ap really shows the knobs and abilities that they have to tweak the reset on power level and then they will fuck it all up in a year sure and we'll all be complaining about 70 percent win rate new codex i can't believe it's got ap5 weapons yes yes <laughs> yes i get it that's probably going to happen but it's nice to have the reset to normality kind of existing and while i'm joking about that it also is a hopeful thing because like when they did this ad and we had our part where we were sad about how psychic is being treated it is very possible that they are smart game designers and are aware there are multiple factions within the game that only have the defining trait of being good at psychic Right. It is possible that when we get to the Grey Knight Codex or the Thousand Suns Codex, they're like, the psychic armies are going to break the rule that every other psyker deals with. Yeah. You get one on your data sheet. They have a pick from the six on the army rule page. That would be very cool. That would solve a lot of my issues with that. And it's very possible that's reality and you just don't go into because it's a sales pitch. It's day one. You bring up a valid point and I would be okay with that. That would probably fix a lot of my hesitation to it. So thank you for bringing that up because I hadn't actually thought of that. And it was mostly disappointing on the Grey Knight side. So I have hope again and am cautiously optimistic. All right, but that's enough talking about data sheets and all that rule stuff. Let's talk about the other subtypes of games because they got mentioned too for 10th edition. Yeah. One is this new thing you've never heard of, Eric. They advertised it. It's a brand new idea. They're called combat patrols. Oh my God. And it's a thing where you're going to be able to buy some boxes off the shelf that are called combat patrols and play them against each other. <gasps> and that's all you need to play the game. You just buy the box off the shelf. Your buddy buys his. They're balanced against each other. Really? And you can play 40k against each other in a balanced game mode. You can pick the Admech box. I'm going to pick the Grey Knight box. Okay, that sounds so fun. I can't wait to try this out. <laughs> So they did advertise this as they're apparently making a new official game mode called Combat Patrol. Yes, that already exists, but we're going to pretend it's new. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they're saying this is, let me read the exact quote. This version is designed to be easy to collect and easy to play. Combat Patrol pitches small preset and balanced forces against each other with armies made from Combat Patrol boxes. My guess is there will be rules saying for like a 300 point game or whatever, 
that will tell you the Grey Knight only gets to bring the foot character and five strikes. <laughs> the Admet guy gets to bring the whole box. Yeah, right. That's what I'm getting out of how they worded it as like a new thing is it is custom designed to make these boxes feel balanced against each other finally. Good. That's what it was supposed to be, or at least that's what it felt like it was sold as originally. It's what the idea was when it was done by game developers. Yeah. Before someone said, hey, Zangor aren't selling. (laughs) (laughs) Put it in every box. You have to put less models in there and put in these upgrade sprues nobody buys and pretend those are worth money. Yeah. (laughs) That is hilarious. I mean, it is good news. It is very good news. I really appreciate that they're trying to work more towards making combat patrols balanced. And I hope that they don't just, like, drop boarding patrols. That's the other thing they talked about. Boarding patrols are supposed to work in 10th edition. Right. For now. But at least it didn't feel like there was any expectation of continually expanding it. Honestly, he stopped himself. Yeah. If you go back and watch when they're talking about it, where he made it sound like they'll be supposed into and he like stopped himself where it's like okay oh they're going to be supported for you know the first core rules and it'll exist yeah i hope they continue because honestly like we said last episode i think it's a good game mode i prefer some things that come from combat patrols because i do love the big models right and that's fair but boarding patrols is better balanced than combat patrols ever were and at the same time boarding patrols with the more streamlined style of rules and all that stuff it honestly just feels like it's becoming a real game (laughs) <laughs> and and I mean that in like a, oh people can like actually play it and be competitive so we'll see where that goes all right but on that note that about wraps it up for this week it's been quite an adventure we have infinite more to think about than we did two days ago oh yeah it's interesting how much was confirmed from what we had all thought and at the same time there's also really interesting things that's new to explore yeah and the big takeaways are if you're a fan of tyranids or space marines or seraphon get your wallets ready (laughs) let's go all right but let's get out of here sounds good